Hi guys. So we are at the one year. It's been one year since Jonathan Majors was arrested. He was arrested on March 25th, 2023, because he called 911. And when the police showed up, they decided that he was the one that did something wrong. Um, if you're new to this, if you haven't been following along, pay attention to the live chat. We're going to go over a lot of details in this, but there's still only a fraction of what I would say is exonerating evidence towards Jonathan Majors and evidence that suggests that Grace Jabari was actually the one that committed assault against Jonathan Majors on March 25th of 2023. In the stream, we're going to look at transcripts from Detective Mejia. He found probable cause to arrest Grace Jabari for domestic assault. We are also going to look at some reports from different news outlets that talk about the prosecution giving a deal to Grace Jabari in exchange for her testimony and cooperation against Jonathan Majors. Now, that's not unusual. Prosecutors do have discretion. They can decide not to bring a case against two conflicting parties. But the problem here, which we're going to see, the district attorney's office made this decision without investigating the veracity of Jonathan Major's claims, or what the investigative work of the NYPD found against Grace Jabari, which means they just made a preference. They didn't have a basis for making that decision. We're also going to look at a run-through of what happened on March, really March 24th into March 25th. To do this in an organized manner, I am going to rely on some of my own tweets. So sorry to do that, but it's going to keep things short and concise so we can get over to the Detective Mejia transcripts that you guys are all here for. Um, there's a lot here. So again, I'm so thankful for everyone that joins these live streams and comments in the chat to, you know, not just make their own observations and share their insights, but there's so many details that you guys are so helpful in the chat, reminding not just me, but everybody else. We're going to start off obviously on my screen right now is a picture of Jonathan Major's face. You can see all the metadata is attached here on the side to this file. There were three files, three photos, this photo, this photo, and this photo. The first of these two pictures was taken at 2.02 and 2.03 a.m. on March 25th. So Jonathan Majors goes to a hotel room after all of this stuff happens, and he takes these pictures. A couple hours later at 9 in the morning when he wakes up, he finds blood on his pillow and also takes a picture of that. To, to recap, these pictures were not admissible during trial. Uh, Grace Jabari would not lay foundation for them. When we get to the transcripts of Detective Mejia, who relied on these pictures as part of his investigation, where he found probable cause to arrest Grace Jabari for domestic assault, they, the defense tries to get these pictures in again through Detective Mejia. The court won't let it happen. So the jury does not see. The jury is not allowed to see. They do not know about this cut on his face. They do not know about this scratch on his arm. And Grace Jabari made sure to volunteer in her testimony, but I didn't scratch him. I wonder why she had to volunteer that detail. And the jury does not know about this either. So that's important to know. Another thing that's important to know is background. In some of the pre-trial motions, so Priya Chaudhary submitted some letters to the district attorney's office. She also submitted a motion to dismiss and in that, some of the complaints, some of the arguments that the defense team rose was, you know, Brady disclosure. The prosecutor is the government. The prosecutor, that's the state. They have obligations that a defense counsel doesn't. The state prosecutor, they're supposed to produce evidence through discovery to the defense so the defense can prepare a, a fair defense of their client because the client has certain rights that are enumerated to them in the Bill of the Rights of the Constitution of the United States. And Priya Chaudhry, Seth Zuckerman, their law firm, while defending Jonathan Majors in their pretrial motion says, hey, you know, you failed to investigate and or turn over information and discovery in violation of federal Brady and Giglio requirements. You are obligated to do this and you do not. A lot of this involves 911 calls, NYPD investigative work, um, a copy of the I-card for Ms. Jabari's arrest. And there were two. There were two I-cards because there were two reports made in two different precincts. All of that. And on top of it, the stuff that you did turn over to us, the defense complains, 
Whatever you did turn over, you haven't turned over this stuff, you haven't even investigated it, even though you're obligated to. But the stuff that you do turn over, you turn over in a mass of two terabytes of data. And again, this was a misdemeanor assault case. So why was there two terabytes of discovery material, but you don't even meet the basics that you're required to produce, investigate, and turn over to the defense? That was a big part of the pretrial debacle. Another thing that a lot of the public doesn't know. It, this is something that we found out by looking at the trial evidence in these streams. The public doesn't know that Grace Jabari testified that in the second part of the car, because they get in and out of that car multiple times throughout the night, she testified in the second part of that car. This is where his jacket gets ripped. She says that she struck him because she didn't want him to leave the car. She didn't want him to get out of the car. She uses her right hand in this motion. And in evidence, there's this picture of her right hand with this marking here. She tries to testify that that's uh, damage from nail shellac, which this isn't her hand, but this is a picture of what nail shellac damage looks like. It's sort of fissures and peeling and damage to the surface of the nail. But on her injured finger, what Jonathan Majors, the prosecution, made their whole case around that and the, the ear laceration, on her injured finger, there's, to me, quite compelling evidence Plus, combine that with her testimony that she motioned, she struck him, she grabbed at him, grabbed his jacket to prevent him from leaving in the second part of that car when they got in the second time. This doesn't look like shellac damage to the surface, and it's not present on the other hands, which aren't injured the way this one is. She's got this thing that looks very similar to when something peels back under your skin, and the skin underneath your nail separates from the nail itself. General public doesn't know this stuff. And they don't know her testimony about her striking him. Here we are one year later. And I'm so glad that there's a lot more people considering this now today, largely in part thanks to you guys. But a lot of the general public that just hears what, you know, People Magazine or the Rolling Stone puts out, or maybe now if they're paying attention to the new civil claim, they're like, oh, there was a verdict rendered. He was found guilty. They don't know the details of the verdict. They don't know that the jury wasn't instructed on the justification charge for self-defense over theft of property, attempted theft of property. They don't know these things. They don't understand that he was also acquitted of two charges. He was acquitted of assault with intent. And there's a whole motion to set aside the verdict, and there's surely going to be appeals about the reckless charges that the jury convicted him on, because there's no testimony from Grace Jabari that this injury, or the injury to her ear, was caused recklessly. She only testified that it was caused intentionally. And there's no other evidence that Jonathan Majors did anything except from Grace Jabari's own words, because the driver says, the only other person in the car besides Jonathan Majors and Grace Jabari, the driver, who says he was looking forward at the road, still suggests that it sounds like he did nothing, she did everything. And the general public is so far removed from the awareness of this. So here we are a year later, not only still having to look at it because He's still pre-sentencing. We're supposed to have a decision on these motions on April 1st. And on April 8th, we have a tentative sentencing date. And then just last week, we have Grace Jabari with the help of Brad Edwards, who uh, it was announced that he was helping her pro bono last year. That's different than Ross Kramer. Um, and then Barbara, I forget her last name, but she's the one that came out and made the statement post-verdict and also right when that ABC interview was being promoted. The first inter the first episode was being, first installment was being promoted. Barbara and Brad helped her file the civil lawsuit in relation to these convictions and the statement that Jonathan Majors made that he's never struck a woman and some statements that Priya Chaudhry made. They're doing an agency blend as part of their argument. But the general public and that civil complaint certainly don't talk about certain things like what we're talking about here. And I think we need to talk about them. So there's that. I do want to toggle over. We, I've done a video on this. I'll link to it in the description if you want to go through it all. Um, I'll also link to all the links to these articles. They're contained in that old video that we did. But I think it's important to note, back in October, when Grace Jabari was finally appearing to volunteer for her arrest, her desk appearance ticket, we had only really two outlets, Insider and The Messenger. 
who's now shut down. The messenger doesn't exist. They're gone. <laughs> I have their article archived. Don't worry. Everywhere else was warring that, oh, we're going to talk about this 115-page motion in response to Jonathan Major's motion to dismiss. People, Rolling Stone, Variety, were going so far as saying, hey, even though outlets like The Messenger are reporting that Grace Jabari is going to be arrested, which was true. They visited back to an old June report from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office relating to the first I-card. And they said, even though The Messenger is reporting this new thing, the district attorney's office a long time ago said that they weren't going to prosecute anyway. It's, she's not going to get arrested. It's not going to happen. It was really just Insider and the Messenger and then people like you guys in the live chat. They were talking about it. That was the extent of the coverage for this. So if we revisit some of this stuff, um, some of it's out of order, but it's important to look at the context. What was happening with this arrest, this I-card, because we're going to look at Detective Mejia's testimony in court, and he was one of the investigating detectives for the second NYPD precinct. What was, what was being said on October 25th when all this was happening? So here from Insider, we do get this mention. You know, Jabari is expected to surrender to police. Manhattan Assistant District Attorney, so this is before. This is ADA Aaron Tierney, before the, she appears for her arrest, before Grace appears for her arrest. Aaron Tierney has already vowed not to prosecute any charges that the NYPD brings against the movement coach. The prosecutor has acknowledged that she has struck an informal agreement with Jabari to have her testify against majors at trial. What's the problem with this? They're making this decision preemptively before doing their own investigation into what's actually being alleged and also investigated by the NYPD as part of the policing part of this. Over here, we see some information, and, and we've looked at these motions in full and this email in full, but Business Insider also notes that, you know, Aaron Tierney, we're not going to prosecute Jabari. They put this quote. We intend to decline to prosecute any charges brought by the NYPD against Grace Jabari related to allegations made by Jonathan Majors regarding the incident that took place on March 23rd, 2023. So they have that date wrong, but whatever. Tierney wrote in the email. Now we have some, we have an email from Chaudhry that she sent off in, I think it was the end of August, but she includes it. She references it in her September motion to dismiss. And we've gotten to look at that. Um, they don't elaborate here on why they plan to decline to prosecute. They don't really have a reason because they didn't wait to see what was presented to them to have an opportunity to investigate what was being presented to them. They preemptively made this decision and made a preference for Grace Jabari. What's even more interesting is in this police complaint that Jonathan Majors files on June 21st, it's actually where we have the first mention of a history of abuse. And this first mention is not a history of abuse by Jonathan Majors against Grace Jabari. This is a history of abuse being alleged by Jonathan Majors against Grace Jabari, his accuser. And we do see this sort of addressed by the prosecutor later. They say that it's Darvo. They say that this is an attempt. This is an attempt of Jonathan Majors trying to Darvo Deny, attack, reverse victim offender roles against his victim, Grace Jabari. But yet, if you study things about Darvo, one of the main complaints is how victims of abuse are afraid to come forward and speak against their, their, their partners, their intimate partners. Yet, the district attorney decides to condemn Jonathan Majors for not coming forward immediately. Yes, he calls 911 the night the morning that he finds girlfriend passed out on the bathroom slash closet floor, unre seemingly unresponsive. We'll get into that in more detail. He calls 911 that night. He mentions, we can kind of see it in some of the body cam footage. She attacked me. He's mentioning to some of these, these injury photos. It's possible he even shows them the photos. We heard that uh, from Priya Chaudhry. He showed some of these photos to the police officers. But they don't believe him then. So when he tries to go to a police precinct and an NYPD officer, one district believes him and says, hey, there's actually an inactive case, so go over to this other precinct and file it there because it's already open over there. He does that. Both precincts find probable cause against Grace Jabari. 
And not just that, but these complaints involve a history of abuse. And they agree that there's enough cause to arrest Grace Jabari for domestic assault. Two. But yet, the district attorney's office, under Alvin Bragg, and it was ADA Michael Perez and ADA Kelly Galloway, you know, they were the trial counsel, trial prosecution for this case that took place in December. They say it's Darvo. But he's the one that the police didn't believe. And he's the one that was hesitant to make his report. And he was the first one to allege this pattern of abuse that we know of. So, Business Insider describes this in detail here. In his domestic, his DIR, Majors alleges that Jabari had attacked him on prior occasions, though none were reported, including a, quote, verbal dispute in London that became physical, as his report to police describes it. NYPD detectives also asked Majors, who has a 10-year-old daughter from a past marriage, a series of yes or no questions. Was that a marriage? That might be a detailed blurb. In the prior history section of the DIR, police checked the yes box to these questions. Is suspect capable of killing your children? T checked yes. Is suspect violently and constantly jealous of you? He checked yes. And has the physical violence increased in frequency or severity over the past six months? He checked yes. Because at that time, March 20, uh, 24th, 25th, would have fallen into that previous six-month period. Major says denied causing any injuries he was arrested over and has insisted through his lawyer that he was not violent to Jabari, who he alleges became violent while accusing him of getting texts of another woman. In the incident report, Major says he did pull away from Jabari as she grabbed for his face, his coat, and his phone. At another point, he admits that when their fight spilled out into traffic, he hoisted her back up into their chauffeured black Cadillac Escalade. Now, remember when he says this stuff, um, when he gave a statement to the prosecution's office, I think it was before he did this, he's the one that actually gave these details. And then Grace Jabari goes in and files a new complaint. And then the prosecution shows up in front of, um, I think it was Rachel Pauley was still the presiding judge at the time. It wasn't Gaffey yet. They changed the language of the complaint to affect new details. Even though Grace Jabari signed the initial DIR with different details, she signed it. So he explains all of that. Uh, Major describes his own injuries in detail to the police precincts. In the morning, my face was stuck to the pillow because of the blood from the cut from Jabari digging her thumbnail into my face. Majors additionally accuses Jabari of running up his credit card without his authorization, returning to London with his iPhone, which she testified in December she still had. They never took that. They never, the, the, the district attorney never looked at it. They never grabbed evidence from it, even though Jonathan Major's iCloud was in evidence. A Rolex vintage watch and other luxury items that cost $6,000 to $7,000, according to the incident report. So there's that. And again, even though the messenger is no longer with us, I do have this archive of this page. So thank goodness. If, if something that we've talked about in any of these videos is ever missing, even if the link doesn't work, you can still go back to one of the old videos and see that it was there at some point. Um, but we also do have this article archived. And shout out to Elizabeth Rosner and Charlotte Phillip here for all the work they did here. If you see them on X, support them because, you know, they're independent journalists now whose organization no longer exists. So here, this is where we get some great information, quotations, before Grace Jabari showed up to turn herself in voluntarily. This is where the Ross Kramer, the, the Sanctuary for Families attorney helping Grace Jabari, pro bono, this is where we get some quotes from him from before she turned herself in for arrest. So, Jabari has been charged with third-degree domestic assault and criminal mischief. Now, remember, criminal mischief is really important because this is why the justification charge should have been read to the jury and the court failed to do so. That's a big part of the motion to set aside the verdict um, and will probably a big, be a big part of the appeal. But in New York State, justification is not an affirmative defense. So, the defense didn't have to build their whole case around this theory of, yes, I am going to admit that I caused her finger injury the way you said I did, but I did it in self-defense. It's not an affirmative defense. They don't need to say that that's the only way her finger injury could have occurred. Because again, she herself testifies that in the second part of the car, she strikes him with this hand. She motions with her right hand, which is the one that's injured. She says, I didn't want him to leave the car. So that's where she's pulling at his jacket, ripping at it, 
We see that she has that nail bend under, under her fingernail. It's the only fingernail that has that. And it's the only finger that's injured. And if your hands are like this, what's the first finger that's going to snag on something? Pulling downward as someone's trying to leave. That maybe your nail gets bent back and messed up in the process. Well, why the defense didn't make an affirmative defense because that finger injury could have happened in that second car part. And it would match Grace Jabari's own testimony. But it's also not required in New York State that you have to take an affirmative defense for the court to be required to read this justification charge to the jury, and yet they failed to do so. So if you're confused why, how did we find reckless assault, but isn't that contradictory? I've got a whole video breaking that down, the specific motion to set aside the verdict. Um, Danny Does Law, I think Danny Does This and That is her actual YouTube handle. Also just had a New York, former New York prosecutor and defense attorney on to speak about that motion to set aside the verdict in the new civil suit. She streamed that yesterday. He gives great insight on how it actually goes on behind the scenes. And one of the topics they talk about is this justification charge and failure to read the justification charge to the jury and why that's hugely problematic. You can go check that out. I'm going to have to edit this to put that in the description, but it is at the beginning of the live chat if you're watching this live. Um, but super important that she was charged with this criminal mischief because it NYPD founds found probable cause that she committed this. There's evidence on the record at trial of this, and yet the court failed to read this jury instruction, and there's tons of case law showing that that is reversible error. So movement coach turns herself in at 5.47 p.m. In her civil suit, she complains that there was all this publicity. It's part of her civil suit for defamation against Jonathan Majors. This is all part of it. Everybody was outside. There was so much media showing up when I had to be arrested. That's in her civil suit. Ross Kramer at the time says, it's very traumatizing to be in the spotlight when you did nothing to put yourself in the spotlight. Even though she's giggling in Lucero's body cam footage, and we hear that on the body cam audio through Priya Chaudhry, we don't get to hear the audio, the court doesn't get to hear it, the, the jury doesn't get to hear it. But she was apparently joking with Officer Lucero, like, giggling, is this going to be in the media? Is this going to be in the press? Oh, we didn't even get to decorate the apartment yet. But now it's very re-traumatizing. So it was a hard night, but hopefully this part of the case is over, and she'll go forward with the DA's office and whatever they need her to do in connection with the other case. She's been very cooperative. And we just saw from the other two outlets, this is all from October News, by the way, ADA Aaron Tierney cut her a deal before she turned herself in for arrest because she's being cooperative. I understand the DA's office that they are declining to prosecute. So this is before, before she even turns herself in and before the prosecutor announces the next morning that they're going to drop these charges. They've already promised me, Ross Kramer, affiliated with the Sanctuary for Families of New York. They told us that beforehand. So this will be dismissed on the papers, if not tonight, then in the immediate future. And this will be the end of this stage. So there's no legal repercussions for her at all with this. The charges will be dismissed. So <laughs> there's a nice catch you up to speed from what was going on back in October before, you know, the trial was pushed forward again. Um, and again, all this reporting by the messenger in real time. There was It was October 23rd. They broke the news that, hey, there's a second I-card and she's supposed to turn herself in for it. On October 24th and October 25th, there was like a huge back and forth between media outlets, really like the Rolling Stone and Variety pushing back against what the messenger was reporting on October 23rd, saying, oh, no, it's not what's going to happen. They wanted to really downplay either that or they just really didn't know, which means they're not doing very good reporting. But they wanted to at least, I would say, downplay anything that could look bad on Grace Jabari. Instead, they made those articles focus all about the 115-page motion in response to the motion to dismiss. And they did this all on the eve of, of when, you know, Jonathan Majors had a major court date, I think, on October 26th. And it's, it's where we find out that the trial is getting pushed back again. But they did all this stuff on the eve to ignore Grace Jabari's, all the I-card, the probable cause, being arrested for domestic violence and criminal mischief, domestic assault. Instead of talking about any of that, these big outlets decide to talk about the prosecution's 115-page response. Now, I promise we are going to get to these transcripts. But let's run through 
let's run through some of the stuff that happened on the 24th and 25th. And I want to start, we've been talking a lot about, you know, car one, car two, car three, criminal mischief, the finger bending back. And even though we don't have this on the record, she says, because Jonathan Majors did not testify. Let me make this bigger. In this ABC interview is where we get this first statement, although it's not on the record in court, but it's where Jonathan Majors tells us, you know what? She never actually had hold of my phone. She was trying to get it out of my hands. She says inside the car, you hit her in the face, yeah. twist her arm behind her back, fracture her middle finger. Yeah. How? Happen. What happened? Yeah. She you saw by the, the video. Phone. I held the phone. I pulled the phone back. She came on top of me, squeezed my... So... I held the phone. She tried to get the phone, pulled it back. She came on top of me. Face, slapped me. Squeeze my face, slapped um, me. That, that's, that's, that's all I remember. So she ends yeah. up with a one inch cut behind her ear. Laceration, yes ma'am. Fractured finger. Yeah. How did those injuries come about? I, I wish to God I knew. Oh my God. So there's that. Now, this became, when we were watching this interview, a lot of it made sense because it's, you know, if he, all this stuff, if, we, if you go back and watch, Danny describes it when she was in court, but then also when we do the transcript reading of direct examination, when it's Galloway asking questions of Grace Jabari, and we get that testimony. We sat in the chat, I was reading it, but in the chat, everyone's trying to figure out the mechanics of all the details she's describing. So she's had a bunch of drinks. Jonathan Major says like, hey, that's really all I remember. And that kind of makes sense. You don't remember play by play of everything that happens. This isn't, there's like a Dragon Ball episode where um, it's one of the tournament fights. I think it's Master Roshi and, and Goku. And the fight happens in like two seconds and the crowd just sees a puff cloud. But the whole episode, the, the 30 minute episode, breaks down frame by frame of Goku and Master Roshi saying what happened in each split second of the fight. And they're like, yeah, so first I did this. And they show the freeze frame and they animate it. It's a great episode. But in real life, that's not how it works, right? You don't remember the play-by-play, -play, at least not accurately, of a scuffle. You just don't remember the specific details. But yet we have pages and pages and pages and pages of Grace Jabari giving these details on direct examination. And we were trying to, as you can watch me, I'm trying to act it out as I'm reading it. So, okay, she says she's turning her back, but she he's doing this while she's turned back and leaned into the corner against the seat. And the details didn't make sense. The details don't add up. And then she starts making, she gets confused over what she was saying was happening with his right hand versus left hand. But then she certainly says he intended to do it all and that she surely knows she never scratched him or anything like that. Those are the things she's absolutely certain of. All just interesting details. Now, what I thought was especially interesting is on day seven of the trial. That's when Jimmy was in court and, and Danny was not. When we read through the transcripts, this is where Priya Chaudhry was pressing on, what are you telling police in this body cam audio that the jury can't hear? Are you not telling him that, you're not telling Officer Swain here that car part two is, you know, things switched up after you missed the strangers. And that's where things turned and majors changed. And that's where your injuries occurred was when you got in the car after that. Car part two. Jabari, when she knew it was getting pulled up, she ran out of the courtroom. She cried. She didn't want to watch it. She didn't want to hear it. Do we have to? She was crying. She said, no, that's not what I hear. It's not what I hear. And Priya pressed on it. They kept trying to approach the bench to no avail. Just like we weren't able to get these pictures in front of the jury. We can't get that audio from the body cam in. So she tries, Priya Chaudhry tries, Grace Shabar doesn't lay the foundation, just like she won't lay foundation for those pictures. I don't know if it's because she has a family of attorneys and she kind of understands how, how it works if you don't lay foundation for something to come in, especially when you already have a feeling of what the judge may or may not decide. I don't know. But what I thought was interesting is if we went back on 12-6, so day six of the trial, Grace Shabari had ended testimony saying... I grabbed him like this, and they make her do it twice. And then Priya Chaudhry says to describe it for the record, she's reaching with her right hand, saying, hey, 
when you grab Mr. Majors, this is, again, this is Galloway doing the questioning, but Priya Chaudhry wants the motions documented for the record. So Galloway asks, Mr. Bari, when you grab Mr. Majors, where did you grab him? The kind of pockets of the, what's it called, the buttons of the jacket. Can you please show us how you grabbed him? Just like that, so she demonstrates. And Chaudhry says, let the, let the record reflect the witness has grabbed her left lapel with her right hand. Record will so reflect. And they stop for the day. The next morning, when testimony resumes, they there's like a page of ch- transcript not quoted here. But they're like, hey, we need to like revisit something from yesterday, your honor. And Gaffey's like, no, come on, you, let's like move this forward. And they're like, no, 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 please. The judge is like, fine, make it quick. So they re-question about this incident. Galloway says, this is the part where you're grabbing him on the jacket or shirt yesterday, right? Yeah, well, I grabbed him once. So she's had a whole day, and they purposely revisit this testimony the next morning. As you testified yesterday, you grabbed him with your right hand, correct? And this is, oh, sorry, this is Chaudhry questioning. I'm wrong. Galloway objects, not in evidence. Gaffey says, just ask the question. So uh, Grace says, anyway, no. So Chaudhry says, you didn't testify about that yesterday? Which hand was it? Uh, He was leaving on the left side of the door. I just recall grabbing the jacket, which that's inaccurate, too, because we know he got out, I guess, if you're looking at the car from the front. But if you're sitting in the car, he gets out into the street side, and it was parked on the left side of the the street. It's a one-way street. So he's actually getting outside the, the door behind the passenger side. So if you're sitting in there, if you're sitting in the car, and he's getting out the passenger side, and you're sitting behind the driver... From your perspective of where you'd be sitting, if you describe someone getting out the left side, they'd be getting out of the car on the curb on this one-way street where they're pulled over on the left-hand side. Not not that way. Not to your your right. She's either visualizing this as if someone was looking at the front of the car or her recall sucks. So yeah, then she says, I just recall grabbing the jacket. Yeah, I don't believe. I wouldn't want to say 100% either hands. I wouldn't want to say. You guys in the chat tell me, why wouldn't she want to say? Oops, I know I motioned with that hand, but now thank you. Thank you for letting me get back up there and correct the record on this the next morning. Thank you so much. <laughs> like, like, all right. Love that so much. And again, if you wanted to see the pictures here, this is, you know, the buttons are both ripped. The pocket is further up and that's ripped over here. You know, all those fun details. So anyway, you know, visiting what we had learned from the ABC interview and in, in court, the only thing on the record is Grace Jabari saying that I'm the one that got the phone. I took the phone out of his hand and I was turning away from him holding it so he couldn't get it back because I wanted to know who that woman was. I wanted to see the messages. He, she's the only one on the record saying anything like that. And off the record in this ABC interview, we have Jonathan Majors say the scuffle outside of the car. But she texts him on March 25th, after she's arrest- after he's arrested, she gets out of the hospital, and she texts Jonathan Majors, and one part of that is, I told them it was my fault for trying to grab your phone. Now, we don't have his testimony on the record. He didn't testify. But doesn't that language make more sense? It aligns a bit more with the version of events that says, she tried to get the phone out of my hand while I was holding it, and then she got on top of me to try to get the phone. And we have her say, I told him it was my fault for trying to grab your phone. Not because I had your phone or because you wanted to get your phone back from me. Trying to grab your phone. This is contemporaneous. She texted this on March 25th to Jonathan Majors. So then, all through her testimony, she seems set on establishing that he's the one that made contact with... with she admits to starting the altercation in car one. But in car part two, she's like, oh... No, he started all that altercation. And why would that be important? If we operate on the presumption that car part one, she tries to get the phone, doesn't. They chase each other for five five blocks. And then she meets the strangers on the sidewalk. And she tells Officer Swain, and we're not able to hear the audio, but according to Priya Chaudhry and the line of questioning, he she tells Swain, hey, after I met those strangers and they were so nice to me, Jonathan Majors, he was coming back to look for the car. We're going to the car together. And then... That's when everything happened. That's when he got, he changed. Things changed. And I think that's when my injuries occurred. Well, if you say that to Officer Swain, 
and you cry and beg for that audio not to be played to the jury. And the jury never ultimately hears this police body cam audio. And then your testimony is hyper-focused on establishing that Jonathan Majors is the one that starts the problem in car part two. That's your focus. Why might that be? If you know that you've been arrested because of probable cause, you had probable cause to be arrested for domestic assault. <laughs> and in car part two is when you rip his jacket, cut his face, and cut his arm. You need to make sure you make a case because you're testifying under oath here. You wouldn't want to say anything that makes you the aggressor in the same instance that caused these injuries that you had to turn yourself in for. Even though that arrest went away, thanks to the DA. So she gives this weird testimony. If you want to revisit that, I totally recommend looking at that testimony. Um, but here's why it doesn't make sense. Here's a video of car part two and how quickly they get in and out. And this, the video had itself sped up. This is from, this is from one of their exhibits. I think this is the prosecutor's collaboration. Now, see, it's a one-way street. The car's pulled up on the left curb. The door is currently open. You can see Chloe standing over here. There's Max and Shams. Now, they, they're they about to look. They're talking. They're shaking the driver's hands. Now they're going to get into the car. And this is normal speed. They're not speeding this up anymore. So you can see her head on top of the car, like over here still, not quite inside. I know it's tiny, but there's multiple faces, heads sticking up over here. So they're still in front of the door, not quite in the car, getting in from behind the, pass the driver's side. Now the door is moving a little bit. They're getting inside. Now the door is opening already. This is real time. This isn't sped up. Look, you see arms moving. He's trying to get out. Look at the arms filling. Now she's out of the car with him. He almost starts to run, but then they walk to the sidewalk. And Chloe's coming right over to Grace. Now this is something we do know that luckily the public has seen that first car part video and the chase scene. The, the public, most of the public is aware of that chase video footage, but a lot of them aren't aware of this part and the testimony regarding it and the possibility that she told police that this is actually where my injuries happened. They don't know that context. And she testifies that it was like two minutes and she swears. She gives pages of details about how he was the one that started it all in this part of the car. But what, how much could happen in the time that the, do we see the door start to close and this door is already opening with Jonathan Majors clearly trying to get out with arms flailing at him? How does her version of events or her recall, maybe she genuinely believes it, how is that credible? You can't convince me that it is. So then we know the rest of the story. She's She keeps claiming that she doesn't want to tell police everything that happened. Um, in her testimony, this is where she's describing that they were in the car for a couple of minutes in that clip we just watched, where it was like two seconds. <laughs> like, then they ask her, why are you running away? Why are you running away? And Galloway says, oh, objection, ask and answer. Don't keep asking her that. Um, she insists that he was pushing her in the car. He started this whole altercation in the clip that we just watched. He sat in the back seat. She sat in the second row behind the driver. Yeah, he pushed me. Yep. He pushed you and we're in your body. Well, I was facing him and he was facing me. And as he tried to leave, he just pushed me so I didn't go after him. But we clearly see her going after him in the doorway. <laughs> like, they get in and out. How did he have time to get to the third row? They were facing each other and he tries to push her to get out. It doesn't make sense at all. Doesn't make sense. <sighs> It was forcible. Yeah, heavy, hard. It was very strong. What was said before he pushed you? Just that he didn't want to talk about the message. He was unresponsive to my questioning. And she insists, I just wanted to know who Cleopatra was. So she's not talking about her issue being, you just attacked me and now I want answers for you attacking me in car part one. I still just want to know who Cleopatra is. 
Then she says that this is how Jonathan Majors gets out in that split second. He climbed across the seats and got out. And that's when I pulled at his shirt, because I wanted him to stay in the vehicle. I didn't want him to leave. And how was Mr. Majors' body positioned when he pushed you? According to you, he was coming toward me, because I was kind of sitting. So the car has two seats in the back rows like there. I was sat here, and my body was facing him. So he's in the back seat. So she's turned in the second row seat behind the driver, facing him in the back seat. I went to grab his shirt in response to him leaving. He sat in the back, right between the second and the middle seat, and I was behind the driver. So she's repeating all of this. He was sat in the back on the right, mainly between the right and the middle seat, and I was sat directly behind the driver again. <laughs> like, she says this multiple times. And let's just run this back. This all happened. This is currently sped up, but let's go to where it's not sped up. So right here at this part, we still see multiple heads. The door is still fully open on the left side where they're getting into the car. Maybe let me... Still there. They're all still standing there. Now we see the door moving a little bit. I still see more than one head there. Now the door is moving. So this is where they're getting into the car. Look at the door open already. That's how quickly it happened. When did he get into the... What? Like... So sorry to take you down redundancy, redundancy lane here to watch this twice, but how did anything she testified to and she repeated herself, Priya Chaudhry made her repeat herself, where did any of those details she describes happen here? <sighs> so, you know, <laughs> like, she's got that bent finger. Now, remember. They get back together after this moment. They, they're in front of the car. They're trying to talk it out. Chloe and the friends, they're like, they have this party to go to, but they want to help this stranger that they found. The third time, Jonathan Majors just says, hey, you can take the car. I just want to go to a hotel. And Grace Jabari is still complaining that the issue is the fidelity. So at that third time that you're at the car, this is the final time you see Jonathan Majors that night. Did you want Mr. Majors to leave you and go to a hotel by himself? No. I imagine I wanted him to stay and talk about what he had done. And that's the infidelity? Yes. So she uses this language that could be, uh-oh. But nope, it's only the infidelity. That's what he'd done. That's what I wanted him to talk about. So we've, we've kind of beat a dead horse with that finger injury there. But I want to talk about her testimony on the arrest before we get to Detective Mejia's testimony. So Grace Jabari obviously took the stand before Detective Mejia. Detective Mejia was a defense witness. Grace Jabari actually saw in the press that there was an iCard out for her arrest, and she texted ADA Kelly Galloway directly. That was an interesting detail. Now, when she's asked, what's your understanding of the status of those charges? Grace Jabari says they don't exist. So thanks to all of the work of the district attorney's office, Grace Jabari says, it's my understanding that my arrest, those records, water under the bridge doesn't exist as far as anybody knows. And the jury is not allowed to know about it either. So, interesting, interesting background stuff. The last thing I want to talk about is, I want to reiterate, because this is one year later, Jonathan Majors is the one that calls the police. We're now past all the club partying stuff. If we fast forward to what happens when Grace Jabari gets home, gets to the penthouse apartment. She didn't talk to Holly Blakey yet. She tried to call Jonathan Majors 32 times. And she was sending out a bunch of sporadic text messages. The last one that we're aware of was the, there's no note, just you knowing what happened. She sends these final three text messages. We don't get to see all the text messages. They're not in evidence. The jury doesn't get to see everything. But we do know that she sent three text messages to Jonathan Majors. 7.47 a.m., 7.51 a.m., and 7.52 a.m. That 7.52 one is the, there's no note, just you knowing what happened. That was at 7.52. The first time she tries to reach out to Blake, Holly Blakey, it's four minutes after that last text message, after a slew of text messages and 32 calls to Jonathan Majors going unanswered. Four minutes after that is when she first reaches out to Holly Blakey. She doesn't answer. Holly Blakey isn't picking up the phone. So Grace just, because there's no answer, sends a photo of her injuries and says she got really scrappy with Majors. And that's where, you know, we kind of get to this whole timeline of 
She's supposed to be passed out on the floor. Jonathan Majors is banging on the door. She's also texting Holly, but a couple minutes later, she's passed out unresponsive when Jonathan Majors gets access to the bathroom where she's laying. But she was just texting her friend. And you can watch the other videos to see how that goes. With that being said, let's get over to what we're all here for. Let's get over to Jonathan, uh, to Jonathan, to Detective Ronnie Mejia's testimony. Now, again, this was towards the end of the case, right before deliberations. I believe after him, it may have just been Jonathan Major's manager, Elon, Elon Rispoli, who testified, hey, I'm the one, I was on the phone with him when he went back to the penthouse and I heard him pounding on the door like this and he's banging on the witness stand um, 70 to 80 times, he says, that Jonathan Majors was knocking, but Grace Jabari, there's no response, even though she's texting her friend at the time. So, lots of inconsistencies there that we're not going to clog this video up with, but if I haven't given you enough inconsistencies from Grace Jabari so far in this video, just know there's a whole world of inconsistencies out there, and I think that's going to be very interesting for her civil suit, all things considered. But let's, let's jump into this. So, he takes his oath, right? He's introducing himself. And then, remember, since this is a defense witness, this is Seth Zuckerman. This is, you know, he's part of Jonathan Major's uh, defense team. This is direct examination by the defense because it's their own witness. So good morning, detective. I'm going to ask you to come close to the microphone. He goes through his full name. He's employed by the NYPD. He's part of the 10th squad, the 10th precinct. And when did you first join the NYPD? So he's been here since 2010, July 6, 2010. He knows the exact date and everything. And can you tell us where you first started when you joined the NYPD in 2010? I started in the Bronx, the 4 to, four to 7 precinct foot patrol. How long were you there? So I did two years, then I moved to the 42nd precinct South Bronx. Then I worked in the 4 to 5 plainclothes anti-crime unit. Um, he was there for, he's an officer for seven years, and then he joined the narcotics unit in Manhattan South, and that's how he got his detective shield. When did you become a detective? 2017. How long have you been a detective in the 10th precinct? I got to the 10th precinct 2020, so three years. In your time as a member of the NYPD, have you received any commendations or medals? Yes. Can you describe what those are? For gun arrests, cop of the year, just honorable work, merit awards. Can you explain what the difference is between a detective and a patrol officer? Patrol officers usually, usually respond to live calls. 911 jobs. Detectives, we do long-term case investigations. Now, revisit some of the stuff that Officer Swain testified to. He was asked, like, hey, you mentioned being unsure of a timeline. And Officer Swain was like, well, yeah, because at some point... We kind of realized that whatever happened, whatever we're being called for here to this penthouse apartment, didn't actually happen right here and now. Something that happened like the night before. So Swain is a patrol officer responding to this 911 call, and he's like, oh, there's stuff that happened before all this. And Priya Chandri emails the district attorney office in August asking for Brady information that they're supposed to investigate and supposed to disclose, and that they've done neither all regarding what took place on the street, investigating possible witnesses, looking for 911 calls, all of this other stuff that would be investigative work the district attorney wasn't pursuing. Even though they made a decision not to at the time of, of trial, they made the decision not to prosecute Grace Jabari. But their own officers, the ones that they were relying on for the initial charges and the refiled charges, were like, Hey, we learned that there was way more that happened before we were called to this penthouse apartment. We don't know anything about that, though. Prosecution didn't think that was important. So, are there detectives and officers within the same precinct? Yes. So, in the 10th precinct, there's a detective squad, and there's also patrol officers, right? Correct. Do you know an officer by the name of Brendan Swain? Sorry, I didn't read this. This is a blind read. So, we might be going right into what I was talking about. Yes. Do you know an officer by the name of Eric Lucero? Yes. And do you know a sergeant by the name of Brian Hansen? Yes. They're all in March of 2023. They were members of the 10th Precinct, correct? Yes. And as a detective of the 10th Precinct Detective Squad, who's your current supervisor? He says Lieutenant Conti, Richard Conti. What sort of things do you investigate as a member of the 10th Precinct Detective Squad? 
Well, we do homicides, robberies, burglaries, grand larcenies, shootings, domestic violence cases, missing persons, an array of things. Well, how do you get assigned to any particular case? So there's a catch. And if your name is up, you catch the case. Usually I do catch domestic violence cases. Is that a specialty that you have within the precinct? Yes. When you first get assigned a case, how do you go about investigating a case? Well, interviewing the victim, looking over evidence that's provided, and trying to recover surveillance or video of the incident. When you look at evidence and you interview the complainant, what are you trying to determine? And if there's an objection and it's sustained. What does probable cause mean? So that's probably the question, objection, sustained. So this isn't, they're trying not to let this come in and the judge is saying, nope, can't come in. Did there come a time when you first had contact with Jonathan Majors? Yes. Can you just identify Mr. Majors if you see him in the courtroom? The gentleman with the gray suit, blue tie. And when did you first? Um, so Gaffey notes for the record that he's indicating Mr. Majors. Thanks, Your Honor. When did you first meet Mr. Majors? I believe June 22nd. Can I look at my notes to refresh? So judge says, will that refresh your recollection as to the time of the meeting? Yes. Well, I'll take a look at that. Just read them to yourself. And when you're done with them, just put them down. Let us know if anything ref refreshes your recollection. So he looks and says June 22nd, 2023. Where is that meeting? Well, that's at the 10th squad office, the 10th precinct. And where is that located? So 230 West 20th Street in the Chelsea area. Before June 22nd, how, if at all, were you involved in the case in which Mr. Majors is the defendant? Objection, objection, overruled. You can answer that. I was not involved. Tell us about your first meeting that you had. And this is important because that's saying, hey, you have, <laughs> you had police work where Officer Swain was like, hey, there's like missing details here. We're just here to arrest because we're on patrol. But, you know, we have that from Officer Swain's testimony. We had some concern, but that's not us to like look into. We have a separate unit for that. And now the defense is saying, well, here's our witness. And we're going to get some information from him about how that investigative detective work process works. And so Detective Mejia is letting us know here. This is such a small detail. But Detective Mejia is letting us know that none of this investigation occurred at the prompt of the state. The state never said, hey, NYPD, thanks for being our policing body. With this arrest that you just made and that you're cloudy, it seems like something happened before because the alleged incident is not at the site that you responded to while you were on patrol. Can you go and take a look at this for us? Because the state is obligated to do this investigative work. They're obligated to do it and they're obligated to turn over what they find out in discovery to the defense. They did neither. And this is such an important two lines. It's probably why Perez is like, objection, objection, objection. The state did not ask the policing body to investigate this any further. It never went to the detective squad of the 10th precinct where the case was active and open. This is a blind read for me. This is, this is a huge, tiny answer here. So tell us about the first meeting you have with Mr. Majors, because it's only because Mr. Majors and Priya Chandri took this initiative that anyone even looked at this at all. How did it come to be that you had a meeting with Mr. Majors? Objection. No, you could answer that just succinctly. Don't get into detail. This is so, I'm telling you guys, if you've heard me say, I think the defense was blindsided. They were promised before trial actually gavel to gavel. They were promised that they would be able to talk about Grace Jabari's arrest. And Gaffey said at that time, on the flip side, Galloway, since you're having an issue with them being able to talk about it, I'm telling them they could talk about it, but fine. You can ask, you know, the timing of this. You can ask questions about the timing of it and whatever else you want to do, but the defense is going to be able to ask questions about this arrest and get the arrest on the record. Well, during trial, we see that even though the state is allowed to poke holes and, and say it's, it's Darvo and, and all of this stuff that Jonathan Majors was trying to do this against Grace Jabari. We have all these objections when it comes to either Grace being asked or Detective Mejia being asked. It's sustained right away. We don't really get much on the record at all. We know we don't get those pictures of the injuries. None of that. The jury doesn't know any of this. So I really think the defense was blindsided that they had the small constrained scope that they were able to talk about. And the prosecution got a lot more leeway, even though they're the ones that were supposed to 
prompt this investigation, this detective work in the first place. Very, very interesting. So they say, you know, he walked in, Jonathan Majors walks in to the 10th precinct to make a report. Objection. No, that's overruled. Okay, ask your next question. So Seth Zuckerman continues. Now, when you say walked in, what do you mean by that? He came in to make a report. And are you aware, only if you're aware, of whether or not been a, there had been a prior report made? Objection sustained. And this is important because he tried, Jonathan Majors tried to go to another precinct first. They also found probable cause, but that's when they said, hey, you know what? It was uh, precinct three, third precinct. You know what? There's already an active case open somewhere else. So take this and bring it over to the 10th precinct and refile your complaint there. But before he's able to answer, Perez objects and court sustains the objection. Now, I do want to see... Daisy, you are right in time. <laughs> That's so funny because I went through some of the background information of how we got here, what happened on, you know, with the prosecutor deals, Ross Kramer, all of that. And I'm sure you already did your homework, so you're just in time for the new stuff. Um, and let's see. I know you guys have a lot of comments between yourselves. I don't want to go backwards and get confused, but I am very curious... Let's see. This is a good point. So Barbara says, it feels like Jonathan Majors and Priya didn't want to file charges because they really thought this case would be dismissed. After the DA and judge kept it going is when they finally said, hold on a minute. And that's a really, really good point. But instead, you've got people out there that say, hey, this is the type of thing. Grace Jabari is clearly the victim. And any attempt by someone to say that she abused somebody, she assaulted somebody, is just Darvo. And I really don't think that that's a fair assertion. I think that's, I think that's victim blame, blaming against Jonathan Majors, quite frankly. <sighs> and then, hey, Lauren. So, Lauren, I think, did you, were you in court this day? You said you were in court this day, right? With uh, Detective Mejia. I almost said Lucero. With Detective Mejia on the stand. So, Lauren Victoria Burke, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure you were there that day. And you're saying that his testimony was blocked because all of this is counter to the agenda of the assistant DAs in Bragg's office. I mean, I completely, completely agree. And it's just interesting now to see. Honestly, I think if I was sitting in the courtroom, this happens pretty fast, right? But being able to read it and read the specific language and see when the objections are being sustained, when the objections are being raised, for one but also when they're being sustained, you know, being able to pause and read it and see specifically is, is very, very telling. Versus when the judge is a little bit more like, no, you can answer, but only succinctly, don't say too much. <laughs> so I wonder, guys, do you think Judge Gaffey is going to tell uh, Detective Mejia, or tell the jury, that Detective Mejia is going to tell us what really happened? Because he told the jury that Grace Jabari was going to tell us what really happened. And I thought that was very, um, you know, juries put a lot of weight behind things that judges say. So if the judge is saying that a witness is going to tell you what really happened, it's, it's implicitly saying that that witness is credible and they have knowledge of exactly what happened and what you need to hear and, and find facts using. Uh, but I guess we're not going to see him. I bet we won't see him tell the jury that about Detective Mejia here. So let's get back to June 22nd, 2023. So who was present on June 22nd? On June 22nd, it was his representative, his lawyer. Where was Mr. Majors? He was out of state. Did you speak with Mr. Majors? Yes. How did you speak with him? We had a video time face call. Is that something you normally do? So Perez objects as to relevance and then withdraws the objection. It's overruled. You could answer that. My supervisor told me this. No, is that something you normally do? Not what your supervisor told you? No. So Zuckerman says, well, why did you do that? Well, it was brought to my attention. This was an important case. Objection. Sustained. That will be stricken. Thank you. Who, if anyone, did you speak with prior to speaking with Mr. Majors over FaceTime? Now, actually, let me preface here. There is a good amount of... Um, there's a good amount of tension, from my understanding, and also, you know, I can, I, once someone tells me that, and I can kind of see how things are playing out, maybe it's a little bit of confirmation bias, but based on the way things play out, 
it seems to corroborate what I've heard rumblings behind the scenes. People that are reporters in, in, the, in New York that do a lot of reporting on NYPD, there's a lot of tension currently and especially while this was going on between the NYPD and the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. A lot of it had to do with a case involving the indictment of a police officer. So, you know, even though the, the NYPD may, in some regard, they're the policing agency for which the prosecution, the district attorney might decide to prosecute something, you know, policing body versus prosecutorial body. There was a lot of tension between the NYPD and the district attorney's office at this time because of another case basically involving one of our own is how I look at it. So, and maybe that's something what I'm saying is not something that Lauren Victoria Burke told me. This is from two other people that do some reporting in on the NYPD. Um, but maybe Lauren Victoria Burke has some more insight on that. That's really all I know. But it's just something someone mentioned to me because they thought all of the stuff with the iCard, they both thought it was very interesting how it came to be on October 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so that could be underlying context that exists outside of this case. But maybe it was a very important case, not just because of Jonathan Majors being a celebrity, but because this case was gaining so much attention and it was a chance for the NYPD to kind of butt heads with the district attorney's office. Just a possibility. So that's sustained, stricken from the record. Who, if anyone, did you speak with prior to speaking with Mr. Majors over FaceTime? Objection to the forum. Did you speak with anyone else prior to speaking with Mr. Majors over FaceTime on June 22nd? Objection again about. <laughs> so Zuckerman says, about the complaint that Mr. Majors was making. No. And again, this goes back to that little important answer we heard earlier, that nobody went to the investigative body, the investigative squad, the detective squad of the 10th precinct of the NYPD while this case was open, while this was an active case. Nobody went, nobody from the prosecution's office went and said, hey, what are the, you're the, the domestic violence specialty detective unit here. What are you figuring out about this thing that we got this call for on March 25th? And our officers responded, but then they found out whatever's being alleged didn't even take place here and then. It took place earlier in the night somewhere else. We need you to investigate this. They don't. Nobody contacts the detective squad. This is this is a really important part of Detective Mejia's testimony, even though it's being objected to out the wazoo. So, and you said that Mr. Mage's attorney was present, correct? Yes. And is that Ms. Chaudhry? Yes. How long was your conversation with Mr. Majors on that date? It was easily over an hour, maybe two hours, which means we're getting details. There's questions being asked. It's not just someone filing a complaint, submitting it, and walking out. Who was asking the questions? I was. And who was answering those questions? Objection. You can answer Mr. Majors. So, from this testimony... Rather than it being big boss mama Priya Chaudhry walking in and, hey, you need to do this and this is what happened and whatever. This isn't like Priya Chaudhry walked in with the letter to the court that we read back in April. This is, hey, like, here's my client. He's here. I'm his counsel. And then the conversation continued between Jonathan Majors and Detective Mejia with Detective Mejia in control of the questions, the interview, all of that. As a detective, what is the purpose of interviewing a complainant? Well, getting all the facts and finding out what happened on the incident that is being alleged. In addition to speaking with Mr. Majors, did you review any other evidence on that day? Objection sustained. In addition, what do you think they're trying to talk about here? What evidence? In addition to speaking with Mr. Majors, did you review anything else on that day? Objection sustained. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Do, 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 do. Well, not that picture. Maybe these, <laughs> you know, maybe. What else did you do on June 22nd with regard to the complaint that Mr. Majors was making? We went over the details of what he was reporting. This is the most vague answer, and Perez still objects. That answer will stand. That's overruled. Perez is probably sweaty during this line of questioning. And let's let's take it one step back. Let's let's step back. None of this can come in, right? But when you look at it, and the defense has the right, guys. Oh my gosh. 
the defense has the right to be able to defend themselves. The prosecution is not supposed to seek a win. They're supposed to seek justice. And here, in the courtroom, we're seeing it play out where what the defense can admit to the jury on the record in defense of their client is this, that, that's the scope of it. <laughs> but we have a full day of testimony about stuff that has nothing to do with March 25th when Grace Jabari was on the stand. She's a prosecutor's witness, star witness. And we get a whole page of, a whole day of direct examination testimony from Grace Jabari about things that have nothing to do with March 25th. I think March 20, I think that day ended with what happened on March 24th, going to this play, and then they're getting in the car and all that. Whole day. But we're not allowed to ask Detective Mejia, hey, you did some detective work specifically about March 25th. Did you see any evidence of stuff on March 20th? Oh, we can't ask that question. <sighs> did you have the opportunity to review anything? We're trying to be as vague as possible here. Zuckerman is just trying to be able to ask anything. I'm telling you, I really think the court blindsided them by saying, hey, you can talk about this arrest and then this happens. Uh, yes, so Perez has asked and answered. No, that answer will stand. Go ahead. So Perez is just lodging objections. What did you review? I reviewed photos and video. What were the photos of? Objection, objection. They're both objecting. This is Kelly Galloway and Michael Perez. Objection, objection. Sustained. I'm going to show, and if you watched the Ryan Strick testimony, that's the DA's defense evidence analyst, it was Defense Exhibit 100, Defense Exhibit 101. And Defense Exhibit 102. Those are these three photos. Same three photos that they tried to have Jabari lay foundation to. But she said, yeah, that's the side of his face, but I don't know if that's his shirt that he's wearing. So the judge is like, oh, you didn't lay enough foundation because Perez kept objecting to this photo coming in during her testimony. These are Defense Exhibits 100, 101, and 102. So they try to bring up Defense Exhibit 100 right now. Detective, do you recognize that photograph? And Perez says, Judge, uh, Gaffey says, show it to the, do you know what this is? Don't show the jury. Galloway and Perez are both like, please don't show the jury. Do not show the jury. Okay. Detective, do you recognize that? Yes. It's a clear yes. He knows what it is. What do you recognize it to be? It's photos of, Gaffey says first. No, no. Perez says objection. Sustained, sustained. If you could just put the photos face down, please. Ask your next question. Did the photographs that you reviewed have accompanying metadata? Now, remember the jury sat through uh, Ryan Strick's testimony. Maybe they tuned it out, but they were arguing back and forth about how Ryan Strick's like, oh, the time zones, there was an issue with the time zone because his iCloud, Jonathan Major's iCloud, was specific standard time, but this happened in New York. These pictures were taken in like New York. So they're getting Detective Mejia to be like, well, the metadata is right there, right? Yes. Can you explain for the members of the jury what metadata is? It's a timestamp of when the photos were taken. Did you learn when those photos were taken? Yes. And what were the dates of those photographs? Can I look at the, to refresh my recollection? Something to refresh your recollection? Let us know when you've had the opportunity to review it. So Perez objects, can we approach? So the judge says, yes, just put the pictures down. They have a conversation at the bench. And then um, he says, I'm just going to look over, refresh my memory. And then Zuckerman says, sure, approximately. Perez is objecting again. Objection, judge. He's about to answer. Does it refresh your recollection, detective? Yes. And what was the date of these photographs? Objection. Sustained. You mentioned that you also reviewed video, correct? Yes. What was that video of? Objection. Sustained. In addition to speaking with Mr. Majors and reviewing photographs and video, what did you do next? I thoroughly went over just time, place, location, went over pretty much the testimony and what he, the questions that I went over and just discussed it with my supervisors. And this is crazy to me because this type of protection is something that would normally, if anything, you would think it would be extended to a defendant that's on trial. But here we have Jonathan Majors accused of something. And even if he wanted to assert affirmative self-defense, how could he do that if he wasn't even able to get these pictures in? Can you imagine? So say Priya Chaudhry approached 
say his defense approached this whole case, their argument, their theory from opening to close was, yes, we're going to say her injuries were caused in car part one by Jonathan Majors, but it was self-defense. It was inadvertent. It was accidental. And it was in self-defense of his own body to prevent bodily harm to himself and to prevent the theft of his personal property. Criminal mischief. Imagine that was the argument that they constrained themselves to. But then they weren't able to even get this in. The judge would not let the jury know this stuff. Even the argument we're saying out here looks like obvious, even if, even if it, the injuries occurred in that moment and there's no other way that they could have occurred. Even if we take that argument out here, we're like, hey, there's evidence that it was self-defense. He's the one that has these injuries here. Her injury is something that looks like an impact. They couldn't even get this stuff in front of the jury. The judge wouldn't allow it. And Perez and Galloway are panicking about the possibility that there would even be the date of March 25th of Jonathan Majors having any fit, uh, photo or video evidence. They don't even want them to say the date out loud. March 25th, March 24th, whatever. They don't even want the answer to what date were these pictures from. Not what were the contents of the photos, but even just the date. Perez and Galloway are freaking out, objecting to and the jury can't know. <sighs> so, in addition to speaking with Mr. Majors and reviewing photos and videos, what did you do next? I thoroughly went over just time, place, location, went over pretty much the testimony and what he, the questions that I went over and just discussed it with my supervisors. Can you tell us what a domestic incident report is? Can, uh, it's an NYPD forum, or forum, stating pretty much facts. When, where, address, the people involved in the incident, and it also has a section where the person making the report, they can put like an affidavit, something that they swear by happened. And remember, just while we're talking about domestic incident reports, remember that Grace Jabari signed hers, even though it was conflicting with other statements. And that's known as a DIR? Yes. Who typically completes a DIR? Objection, relevance. Why do you think that Perez wants to object to that? The court, I'll sustain it, it's sustained. Judge, can we approach on that? Uh, defense wants to approach. Sure. All right, based upon a meeting of the minds at the sidebar, is the objection withdrawn? Perez says, yes, we withdraw, we withdraw that objection. Detective, who usually completes a DAR? The reporter victim. Was there a DAR completed after your interview of Mr. Majors? Yes. And who completed it in this case? His representative. Is that the normal course? No. Why was it done like that in this case? Well, Mr. Majors was out of state. We conducted a video call, so as he narrated what was happening, she wrote down the affidavit. And did there come a time in which he received a signed affidavit from Mr. Majors? Yes. When was that? It was, can I look over my notes to refresh my memory? Sure. Let us know once you've had the opportunity to review something. Who wants to see that affidavit? <laughs> Who wants to see that affidavit? I wonder... Would that be something that is subject to a records request? That'd be interesting. So he's reviewing it. Zuckerman says, with the court's permission, can I hand something to the witness that may short circuit? No, let him look. He said he received a signed DAR. Let him look through his paperwork. I have it. It was for June 26, 2023. So four days after this like FaceTime interview. Jonathan Major submits a signed DIR with this affidavit. Do you know, prior to your involvement on June 22nd, 2023, whether any, whether or not anyone else from the 10th precinct had investigated Mr. Major's complaint? Galloway objects. Judge says, do you know? And Mejia says, no, he doesn't know. So, all right, that answer will stay. Or I guess the answer is, is no, not that he doesn't know but that he doesn't know <laughs> if anyone else. He's not aware that anyone else has been contacted to investigate. Following your interview of Mr. Majors and your review of the items that you mentioned, what did you do next? Well, once probable cause was established, there's those words that he's not allowed to say. Do you think that's fair? That he's not allowed to talk about probable cause? Because we saw it objected to earlier when uh, Zuckerman tried to use it in his questioning. That was objected to and he had to keep watering it down and it kept getting objected to and sustained. Now Mejia is like, well, once probable cause, oh, hold on, objection sustained. 
the last, last answer stricken from the record. So Zuckerman has to just say, well, what did you do next? Conferred with, conferrals with my supervisor, conferrals with many people, Manhattan DA's office. Objection, judge. That's sustained because it's not succinct enough as to when this happened. Ask your next question. Can you, you said on June 22nd, you met with Mr. Majors, and then you said you had conferrals. When did you confer with the Manhattan DA's office? Objection as to relevance. Now that's beautiful because <laughs> it's their obligation to investigate and it's their obligation to disclose in discovery anything about this type of thing to the defense. So how is it relevant? <laughs> did you confer with the Manhattan DA's? So Gaffey's asking, did you confer with the Manhattan DA's office on June 22nd? It was in that, no, on June 22nd. No. All right, next question. You said you also conferred with your supervisors, correct? Correct. What did you do next? Uh, what is called an I-card? What's an I-card? Objection sustained. So I-card is something that is not the same terminology that's used everywhere. In New York, it's a busy precinct. It's, it's, it's like a bench warrant, or not a bench warrant. It's like a warrant out for your, you know, we have a suspect. We want to bring someone in for some questioning. We want to know more information. It's, it's not that different from a warrant, but I guess it's something that isn't used everywhere. And, you know, layman's terms, a jury might not know. So Zuckerman wants it to get on the record. Hey, can you explain what this I-card is? Essentially, it means that we found probable cause. We need to talk to this person. We need to bring them in for questioning because it's probable cause. But Detective Mejia can't say probable cause. And he can't get into a description of what an I-card is. So the jury doesn't know. The jury is not allowed to know. There's probable cause, and she was wanted for questioning in regards to someone making a complaint against her that she committed assault and criminal mischief against them. They won't even let the basics. This isn't a question of you issuing an I-card for Grace Jabari, or you finding probable cause against Grace Jabari. He's not even allowed to tell the jury what probable cause and an I-card is, because they don't even want the jury to get the idea and make the inference. These, that's how strict these objections and, and sustains are. So Perez asked for it to be stricken. I don't think there was an answer. If there was an answer, it's stricken from the record. Detective, after June 22nd, 2023, did you review any additional materials related to Mr. Major's complaint? Um, there was video provided, things that would help in the case, strengthen the case, but nothing. There was no video on the scan drive. All we had was outside from the garage. So I think that's talking about... The black lane vehicle. So they had footage from outside of the garage. But there's nothing on the scan drive from inside the vehicle, maybe. So let's see. Objection. Ask your next question that's sustained. Zuckerman. When you reference the scan drive, did there come a time when you came into possession of a specific hard drive? Yes. Where was that from? We had a drive that was from the taxi or the car. Objection, judge, that's sustained. This is all after June 22nd, correct? Yes. Gaffey's, all, Gaffey's like, all right, move on. This is getting to be very weird from the judge. Because he's sustaining this before... He's sustaining, like, knowing what the follow-up questions will be if the objection isn't sustained right now. That seems to be how Judge Gaffey's moving. So Zuckerman asks, did you have the opportunity to review that drive? Yes. And did it have any videos from March 25th, 2023? Nothing. Now following June 22nd, 2023, did you ever speak with an, object an individual by the name of Grace Jabari? Objection. The relevant part is, did you speak with her on June 22nd, 2023? So this is, Ga this is Gaffey asking this question. So Perez objects. We don't get overruled or sustained. We just have Gaffey reworking the question on behalf of the defense in favor of the prosecution. So Gaffey asked, the relevant part is, did you speak with Mr. Bari on June 22nd? So the witness says no. He says no. Zuckerman tries to say, did you reach out to her at a later time? Yes. When was that? It was within that investigation after the I card was objection, sustained, answers stricken. When was it that you reached out to Mr. Bari? I didn't reach out to Ms. Jabari, but I reached out to her representative. So remember, Grace Jabari finds out in the news that there's some I-card out for her. 
Um, and that's probably the news report stemming from the one issued by Precinct 3. There were two I cards, two precincts found probable cause. Uh, the district attorneys made a statement saying the f first I card was deactivated or would be deactivated. There was some spokesman for the district attorney's office that said that back in like June. So she sees the news. Jabari sees the news. She texts Kelly Galloway directly, which is weird. And then Galloway was like, oh, no, you gotta, you gotta go through your representation. You can't, don't just text me like this. So she has to go to Ross Kramer. So Jabari goes over to her attorney, Ross Kramer. And this is where Detective Mejia is saying, I didn't reach out to Ms. Jabari, but I reached out to her represent representative. When was that? I have to look through my notes. So he looks at the notes and says, August 14th, 2023. Now after June 22nd, 2023, did you ever have contact with Mr. Majors again? After which time? After June 22nd, did you ever speak with Mr. Majors again? Yes. When was that? He came in, he came to the precinct in person, and we re-interviewed him, and he filled out the DIR himself. This was now a second DIR? It was the affidavit part that, just to see him do it in person. And he filled it out, I have it here. The court says, you could ask your next question. What? So, why is the judge doing this? So Mejia is on the stand, he filled it out, I have it here, and the judge is like, oh, you can ask your next question, Zuckerman, come on, move it along, while he's looking, before he pulls out this affidavit. So Zuckerman's like, well, he's looking at the date, judge, August 3rd. So we have June 22nd, June 26th, he sends over the signed affidavit, August 3rd, he comes in to sign the affidavit, hand it in in person, and then on August 14th is when she, the detective Mejia contacts Grace Jabari's representative. You mentioned earlier that at a point after June 22nd, you had conferred with the Manhattan DA's office, correct? Yes. How many times did you confer with the Manhattan DA's office? Objection. Sustained. Following August 14th of 2023, when you spoke with Ms. Jabari's representative, what happened next? We stayed in contact and I just, I was giving him updates on what we needed to close this case with an arrest. So we're talking about Ross Kramer here. And this is why at the beginning of the stream, I went through, you know, all of those, those statements here. Where we already know, they already told us she's co uh, corroborating, and there's going to be no legal repercussions whatsoever. Ross Kramer was already working on it. So, Grace Jabari tries to contact Kelly Galloway right away when she first hears that there's an I card out for her arrest. Probably she was Googling her name and saw it. Who knows? Uh, but Galloway's like, no, you got to go through your representative. So Detective Mejia has to talk through Ross Kramer, but Ross Kramer is conferring with the prosecution. We know he's doing that because he's getting feedback. He's getting statements from Aaron Tierney and the ADAs and the Manhattan District Attorney's Office saying, hey, your client's not, we're not prosecuting her. We're going to drop these if they come across our desk. All while the, the, the detective is trying to do an investigation. It's already being told to Grace Jabari's representative, Ross Kramer. We're not going to do anything anyway. That's problematic because it shows preference for deciding to bring charges against one party and not the other without actually having a basis. Hold on. And I see Artemis. Is <laughs> so, hey, Kat. Hey, y'all. Just joined just in time for another episode of Trash Judge in My Pocket. That's a good way to put it. Because he keeps, he keeps like, Judge Gaffey's really jumping in here. So when Grace Jabari's on the stand, we get, hey, jury, Grace Jabari's going to tell you what really happened. And when Detective Mejia is on the stand, and he's the only one that did detective work regarding, you know, probable cause, investigating any reports by the alleged victim, Jonathan Majors. Nope, can't talk. Can't talk about any of it. You can't even say a date. And I'm going to ask questions and tell the defense, <laughs> like... Move along. Don't let him look at things to refresh his recollection on dates. Ask another question. This is kind of crazy. So, he's talking about here. He's giving updates back and forth with Ross Kramer. Um, what we needed to close this case uh, with an arrest. What's a DAT? A DAT is a ticket that we give to a person to come into court instead of being brought in in person for arraignment. So basically, remove this big public show of someone being arrested. 
just a desk appearance ticket, which has way different optics than someone's arrested and done with a perp walk, dragged into court, dragged back out for an arraignment. Yeah. Does it stand for desk appearance ticket? Correct. And are there any NYPD protocols regarding issuing DATs in domestic violence cases? Objection sustained. Oh, detective, have you ever given a desk appearance ticket in a domestic violence case? Because remember, this is domestic assault and criminal mischief. That's what she has to appear for. That's what Grace Jabari has to appear for. Detective, have you ever given a DAT, a domestic... uh, desk appearance ticket in a domestic violence case. Objection sustained. What's the moving hand here that went from the ordinary procedure, especially in a domestic violence case, the ordinary procedure where someone would would be brought in in person for an arraignment. Instead of that, we're just going to give a dem- desk appearance ticket. What was What was the catalyst here? What was the catalyst here? You have Detective Mejia trying to investigate this. Nobody contacted him to start this investigation, except Majors. District Attorney didn't pursue any investigation from the detective squad of the NYPD, the precinct where this case was active. They don't pursue any investigation, even though they're obligated to. It's their duty. Jonathan Majors has to bring it forward. Then, even though Grace Jabari hears about this and tries to go directly to Kelly Galloway, Kelly Galloway's like, nope, you got to go to your representative, who's Ross Kramer. He's on the board or whatever of the Sanctuary for Families of New York, representing Grace Jabari. Sanctuary for Families, they lobby. They've donated money to Alvin Bragg. Ross Kramer is now corresponding on behalf of his, his representative. He's representing Grace Jabari pro bono. He was appointed to her by Sanctuary for Families of New York. He is now conferring with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, who failed to go to this de- this detective squad and say, hey, can you look into this? It has to be brought to their attention. And Ross Kramer is doing all the messaging work back and forth. So District Attorney's Office is here. Detective squad is here. Ross Kramer's right in the middle of it, playing the messenger. He's the moving hand that says, hey, even though this is not what you do in a domestic violence case, you need to make this a a desk appearance ticket. And we've got all of this right here, thanks to the messenger. Ross Kramer already knows all of this before Grace Shibari even appears for her desk appearance ticket. Already knows everything. So... They're sustaining all these objections about protocol for desk appearance tickets in domestic violence cases. But Zuckerman's comfortable enough to ask, Detective, have you ever gone this route instead of a traditional warrant in a domestic violence case? Because this is domestic assault. And it's objected to, it's sustained. So then Zuckerman says, Are you familiar with the NYPD patrol guide? Yes. That's the mandates in which NYPD officers conduct their job, correct? Yes. What are the protocols regarding domestic violence cases? Protocols we have, objection, Your Honor, sustained. That's a very generalized question. So we have the court giving speaking judgments here. Are there any protocols in the patrol guide regarding desk appearance tickets? Objection, sustained. So we can't even get broad here. You can bring in a whole DV expert to talk about statistics of men against women, which I think is a civil rights violation. Like, you can't just bring in statistics, <laughs> like, to... Statistics shouldn't be used in a court of law. I have problems with people in public condemning someone, the court of public opinion condemning someone because of statistics. But a court of law, a government body, a prosecutor, should absolutely not use statistics as evidence against an individual. And they did it in this case through a DV expert who was allowed to go on the stand and talk about statistics of uh, men committing, you know, being abusive, committing violence against their female intimate partners. They put statistics as expert witness testimony in front of the jury. But here, the judge isn't even allowing, the judge isn't even allowing basic definitions 
from mandates, actual mandates in the NYPD officer conduct manual. You can't even talk about basic protocol. But you introduce, the state was able to introduce, they tried to, I think it's problematic that they even tried to, but the Judge Gaffey allowed that, and especially not this. Judge Gaffey allows statistics to be introduced as expert witness testimony to the jury, saying, hey, statistics show that men are this likely, the, this is the ratio, this is the statistics. And giving expert testimony to help lay a foundation for the case the prosecution's making against an individual, Jonathan Majors, a man. But this can't come in. This is mind-blowing to me. And I'm telling you, this is a blind read. So, like... Objection sustained, objection sustained, objection sustained. Can you just explain what the difference is between a desk appearance ticket as opposed to someone being arrested? Objection, asked and answered. Gaffey does say you can answer that. Desk appearance tickets are defendant is released at the precinct. So the person never gets taken to central booking and is not arraigned in court. So that means there's no, you know, you don't get like the fingerprinting and all that. They come back at a later date. Did there come a time in which you met Grace Jabari? Yes. What were the circumstances? It was to arrest her for objection sustained. The answer will be stricken. What were the circumstances in which, and I bet this is all, we're reading it line by line, right? But I bet this is objections being fired over while people are speaking. What were the circumstances in which you met Ms. Jabari? Objection. Sustained. That was just asked. The entire answer was stricken, Your Honor. I think the first part is admiss- is permissible. Uh, Gaffey says this is after June 22nd. Correct. Sustained. What, if any, int- actions did you take with regard to Ms. Jabari? She was, and the judge cuts in, on what date? Zuckerman says, at any time. Court says, no, no, be specific. On what date? Did you take any actions with regard to Mr. Bari on October 24th of 2023? Objection. The answer, yes or no. Did you take any action? What date did you say? This is Gaffey cutting in again. October 24th. I just said October 24th of 2023. I processed an arrest. The court. Did you take any action? Yes or no? Yes. So I wonder if the court transcriber, court reporter caught this. Casey seems to have caught this. But maybe... All of these were speaking over each other. So I wonder how clearly the jury heard this part. Because he's saying the action, but then the next question from Gaffey is, did you take any action? I feel like this was being said, they were speaking over each other. So what was that action? Objection sustained. That's exactly what happened. They spoke over each other. Court reporter caught it. But this was being said as this was being said. So they try to answer it again, but it's objected to and sustained before they can actually say it. Where was Ms. Jabari on October? Now they're just saying where, because they can't ask anything else. Where was Ms. Jabari on October 24th of 2023? Objection, objection, overruled. Okay, we haven't overruled. Just the specific area, though. Where was she? Where was she located? And I do want to pull this up. I saw this come up in the corner of my eye. You know the jury wasn't paying attention to the detective. Yeah. So they're speaking over... They probably did not catch this part, but Casey did. And it's more interesting. We know he processed an arrest out here in the public, right? But the part that's interesting to me and probably to you guys is seeing how this is avoided in in court, how this is not able to come on the record. This is what the transcript's showing us. We, like, knew it, but look how hard they're fighting to keep this off the record. Why? Why? Two, how is that fair to Jonathan Majors? Three, like, you know, an appeal is supposed to be based on things that are in the record or arguments to and fro about the record. So I'm interested. We're not seeing in the motion to set aside the verdict, but on appeal, I guarantee you we're going to see something like, hey, we had this pretrial agreement that we were going to be allowed to talk about this, but then we weren't able to talk about it. The jury wasn't able to know. And that, without a doubt, should undermine our, the confidence in the verdict against our client. Because the jury wasn't able to consider any of this. They don't know any of this when they're trying to make their decision. That in, in, in conjunction with not being read the, the justification charge. Like, this is insane. Now, guys, again, imagine 
how this would all play out if the defense's theory of the case wasn't, hey, we don't even know how she actually got her injuries. It could have happened in car part two. It could have happened at the club. It could have happened at home. If they went with an affirmative defense, hey, he did it in self-defense because he, she, was attacking him, trying to take his property. But then this is the only testimony from someone besides uh, Grace Jabari about what was happening in that car, besides the driver looking forward. And it was objected to and sustained like this. What evidence would be on the record to back up an affirmative self-defense if they weren't able to introduce all this stuff? Just a mess. So now they have to ask these vague questions. Where was Ms. Jabari on October 24th, 2023? Objection, objection, overruled. Just a specific area. Where she was, where was she located? It was at my office, and she was there at the office, the 10th precinct. Did you provide Mr. Bari with anything? This is the most vague question ever, but it's objected to and it's sustained. What happened at your office on October 24th? Objection, sustained. Did you see Mr. Bari again after October 24th of 2023? Objection as to relevance, sustained. Suckerman says, Your Honor, may we briefly approach? Sure. So they have a sidebar at the bench. Detective, prior to your involvement in the investigation, beginning on June 22, 2023, are you aware whether or not the 10th Precinct Detective Squad was involved in any investigation, any investigation about March 25, 2023? No. So he's part of the Detective Squad. He's part of the specialty branch for DV investigations. He's not aware of any, any other... No other involvement investigating what happened on March 25th. The 10th Precinct Squad was not involved previously. Asked and answered. It's all right, you can answer that. Was not involved. Have you ever met with ADAs Perez or Galloway? I met with them recently this week. When was that? Monday. And I believe Mejia testified on Wednesday. Maybe it was Tuesday. Prior to that, have you ever met with them about this case? No. Thank you, Detective. I have nothing further. So Galloway says, one moment, briefly, Your Honor. Sure. Then she gets up for cross-examination. Good afternoon, Detective. I have just a few clarifying questions. So what was the date of the incident that you were investigating? It was October 25th. Let me rephrase that. The date of the incident that the defense filed a report about. Um, he refreshes his memory. Take your time. In my notes, March 25th. Your investigation didn't begin in March, correct? Correct. And it didn't begin in April, correct? Correct. And it didn't begin in May, correct? Correct. And it began at the end of June, correct? Yes. And on June 22nd, who walked into the precinct that day? His representative, Miss Priya. And you said it's not normal for a defense attorney to write a domestic incident report. Yes. And it's not normal to interview someone via FaceTime to file a police report. Yes. Nothing further. All right. And then no redirect. Now, this actually changes my mind. I, I, I think it was stupid for Galloway to even reiterate this, but all of these questions, your investigation didn't begin in March. She's trying to go with the argument that this is this is Darvo. This is some type of litigation abuse. False false reports. It's a power play. Jonathan Majors against his victim, right? That's what she's going at with this cross-examination. But what's the problem here? It's it's her job to bring to ask this detective squad to do an investigation. And they didn't do that. But yet they agreed not to prosecute Grace Jabari anyway. So what was their reason for deciding to prosecute Jonathan Majors and not Grace Jabari, if not pure preferential decision? Because she said, we, well, no one came to you in March, no one came to you in April, no one came in May. Well, of course, Priya Chandra is going to walk up in there. Because unlike any other Jane or John Doe, who may be indigent and not able to afford an attorney that can dedicate time and resources... Once they see that this case is going to move forward anyway, after Priya Chandri wrote this April 18th letter to the court and probably got a response in mid-May, and then that's when the language of the complaints has changed and they're doubling down on most of the charges, except they dropped the one. Then that's the timeline of this, right? That's when Priya Chandri actually says, oh my God, they're not, they're not going to, this is crazy. She did this to him. And Jonathan maybe is saying, I don't want to file a police report. I don't want to do all that against someone. I still loved Grace. I wouldn't want to do that to an intimate partner, which a DV expert would tell you is normal behavior, right? But somehow when it plays out this way because the prosecutor's office doesn't do their job to investigate something, 
it's a problem. And it's supposed to look bad on the person who was on the receiving end of domestic assault and criminal mischief. So with that being said, if you want to read this transcript on your own, it is in the transcription folder. The link to that whole folder is in the description of this video. I know, yes, let's talk about, I'm going to have a hard time trying to go through some comments because I've tried to get through this and I, I'm not going to know when a certain comment was made, but Nita Bita says, and no plea deal. So we're talking about the domestic, uh, the domestic, the desk appearance ticket not being part of protocol, and also being completely unusual. Zuckerman was trying to say, you've never done a desk appearance ticket in this type of case, have you? And it was sustained. It was objected to and sustained before an answer could be given. But Zuckerman was comfortable saying, ever. This is like the one time first case, first instance that this has happened. Zuckerman was comfortable asking that question. Even though it was objected and sustained, we got no answer. So a desk appearance ticket is completely unusual and outside of protocol. And then we also know that Jonathan Majors wasn't offered a plea deal. Even though with this type of charge, first-time offense, especially in New York, especially in the Manhattan County District Attorney's Office, plea deals very common for this type of charge. But here, what was the reason that Jonathan Majors wasn't offered one? Why are we having Kelly Grace Jabari go through your, your representative and then have him play messenger with us? And he's working it out with the district attorney's office how to get this arrest closed out. Oh, don't make it public. Make it a desk appearance ticket. And we have Grace Jabari complain that, oh, there was this big press showing up where I had to go to my, my precinct. And all this, this stuff. Like, when you think about it, how is this fair to the defendant? And the defendant is the one that has the rights here, not the state, not the witnesses. Although technically Grace Jabari does have the right to invoke the Fifth Amendment against self uh, you know, self-incrimination, but we don't see that elicited in this trial. It was protected before it even had to be elicited because Judge Gaffey wouldn't even let us ask vague questions about a date. I get mad reading stuff like this. And I want to say I'm working on another video. It's, it's Fulton County. So it's separate from this. But what I thought was really interesting is it's an ACLU case that's coming forward against um, the district attorney's office, specifically what Fonnie Willis is in charge of, her diversion unit, and what she's required to do. But a, a nonprofit called Bard Business is bringing forth a lawsuit using ACLU research, and it's being written by ACLU attorneys. They filed a suit, and it's saying, hey, blah, 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 <laughs> And it's Judge Glanville, the YSL judge, is making an appearance in this, too. There's a lot of things that, when I was reading it, just reminded me of what's going on here with this high-profile prosecution of Jonathan Majors for misdemeanor assault. Um, but in this case, they cite... One of the footnotes, they cite something from the messenger because they cite in an exhibit, they cite a September 2023 um, motion that was filed on behalf of someone that's been sitting incarcerated in Fulton County for 434 days without any indictment. The national average is 30 days, guys. In Fulton County, the their average is 291, 261 or 291 days. National average is 30 days. But in Fulton County, there's a huge prison overcrowding problem, uh, jail overcrowding problem. And one specific case that's cited in this lawsuit, it was a motion of this, this person, Mr. Walters, who's sitting there for 436 days. His public defender, she's like, look, I can't even, I've been trying for a year and they can't even tell me what ADAs is appointed to this case. And in the footnotes, I see that they cite a report from the messenger. And Mr. Walters is being held the footnote, guys, the footnote's like, hey, they arrested someone else for what this victim, this victim positively identified this other person that they arrested. It happened in a vehicle. The driver of the vehicle says this person, Mr. Walters, that's now being arrested later after someone else was positively identified as the assaulter. This person's arrested and held without an indictment for 434 days or whatever. 
the driver says this person wasn't even in the vehicle when this happened. And then the messenger's coming in, and there's an article from the messenger side, and I'm like, this is too many parallels between what's going on here. And Jonathan Majors wasn't held, to be fair, right? But we did see in the motion to dismiss, Priya Chandri put forth a lot of arguments about right to a speedy trial. She counted the days. This is exceeding the 90-day limit limitation. And then we find out that Manhattan District Attorney's Office, even though they're not offering a plea deal, they're not trying to investigate anything either. They're going for a win. And they want this to go forward to trial. Their goal isn't to keep him behind bars indefinitely. Because the problem with what the ACLU is saying against the Fulton County District Attorney's Office is even though they have a standard to notify a judge in writing within 45 days, and they have no records of doing this, so they're not actually following this process, within two business days of 45 days passing, they have to send you know, something in writing to a chief judge and say, hey, we still have someone held with no indictment. You need to have a bond hearing for this person because it's code in Georgia. But here, the issue wasn't keeping someone incarcerated, locked up, waiting for an indictment. They slapped an indictment on Jonathan Majors. Then they doubled down and issued a second one. And their goal wasn't just to hold someone indefinitely and try to secure an indictment. They wanted to get a conviction, which means they wanted to get a win. And a prosecutor should never do that. And I just saw these parallels. I saw the messenger cited, and now we know. Rest in peace to the messenger. But what we've got, what we've got out here to find out information, we have to go pull out court transcripts that are at the cheapest, $4.70 a page. If you need them turned around faster, I think Casey hustled me a little bit. She's like, I'm going on vacation. And shout out to her because I think she did a great job transcribing this stuff. Um, but she's like, I'm about to go on vacation. So I paid the, the faster turnaround price per page <laughs> for this and the closing statements and, uh, from the prosecutor and the defense. So, but shout out to her, whatever. Um, she hustled me a little bit. Shout out to her. But if we don't do that, if we don't have this chat, if we don't have like, you know, Artemis, Arbico, Daisy, uh, Barbara or Tracker, we're going by both names here. Earl, you guys have been in here not just listening to learn more, but I also see you guys speaking on these things, which means you're helping kind of getting the information out there. But news media and press like The Messenger, who were the few and far in between, that are looking at important stuff like this. They're the ones that now have this big, we're no longer in existence message. We don't see that for the Rolling Stone. We don't see that for Variety. And in fact, it seems like they're beefing up the culture writer departments from their organizations, which are re really where we get the speculative, sensational, investigative work with these clickbait pieces that somehow also seem to have a good inside look at things like the prosecution's 115-page motion, or reply to the motion to dismiss. Isn't it all interesting? So when I saw, we've got two cases, two totally different districts where someone like the messenger was, you know, kind of doing some more boots on the ground reporting journalism. And they're gone. <laughs> they're gone. So luckily for them, they have the ACLU looking forward. Um, but we obviously don't have that type of involvement here with Jonathan Majors. In fact, we have a nonprofit who seems to lobby for, we know that they've contributed to DA Alvin Bragg. They're helping the prosecution side to secure a win against someone that was accused of something that I say all evidence exonerates him of. But yeah, I'm going to go with Barbara on that one and say they wanted to fundraise off his conviction and secure the elections. Oh, wait, just like Tracker on CVS? Hold on, I don't know what you mean by that. Um, but yeah, so you guys have so many comments here. You guys are saying they hate Priya, the prosecution hates Priya. I'm sure they do. Artemis says the DA had no interest in actual justice. Zero. They wanted a win. And then... Yeah, he didn't want to be seen as a victim either. And this is such a good point because they have a whole expert come in. They have a whole expert come in to explain how victimhood works, right? To, to succinctly say that in like one sentence. This expert gets on the stand to speak generalisms about statistics and how victims might not act the way you would expect them to. 
Why wouldn't someone report right away? Well, here's why. But when we see that exemplified by the man, <laughs> the partner with a penis, the person, the party with the penis, <laughs> we don't get to have that introduced in front of a jury. We get statistics that are men are bad. This is a statistic that shows that even though these statistics have nothing to do with the actual facts of this case that I'm giving expert testimony for. This is how victims behave, except when it's a man behaving that way. Then there's a different explanation. They don't get the same explanation. Isn't that crazy? I think that's crazy. And yeah, so Daisy's going back to the point. So on Kelly Galloway's... Uh, cross-examination there where she's like did, did you invest did someone ask you to investigate in March and April Daisy's saying she's trying to highlight that Jonathan Majors didn't come in sooner not that Officer Swain um, and and all the other you know patrol officers didn't come and do that the patrol officers could have done it and the district attorney could have and was supposed to go to the detective unit to do an investigation and they didn't and I think it's I think it's kind of ironic that Kelly Galloway doesn't understand that she's underscoring that in her cross-examination because it's you know the defense should try to give a good defense to their client right but it's the prosecutor it's the state's obligation to do the investigation if they're bringing charges it's their obligation and they didn't do it and kelly galloway stupidly underscores that in her cross-examination <sighs> And I agree. The fact, Artemis says the fact that they're going so hard to railroad Jonathan Majors is mind boggling, knowing that D disgraced jabroni is trying to milk that on her end too. It makes me feel sick. And that's why when you think about it, I mean, these transcripts, I'm sure it's not, I'm sure it's no surprise to us, right guys? But it is giving us some more detail on when did Ross Kramer come into play? What was Ross Kramer's role in this desk appearance ticket over a regular arrest that would normally be what happens when someone's charged or there's probable cause to arrest someone for domestic assault against their intimate partner we have that piece we knew before that ross kramer knew this before the arrest the desk appearance ticket actually happened we knew and we could speculate how he knew but here we get some well yeah i'm the detective here and i had to correspond through this representative, which we know is Ross Kramer, and he kind of triangulated everything between the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, who never came to us to open an investigation. But they were happy to communicate with us through, they pointed us to Ross Kramer. They started participating to make sure we got this closed up, tied together with a neat bow and a box that we could bury in the backyard as if it didn't exist. I have so many thoughts. <laughs> like, and Tracker says, I honestly, I think this is a deep cover up trying to get more money out of YouTubers intentionally throw keys solely to sell transcripts. <laughs> uh, they're gonna, they're gonna be like, hey, we want, we want to let more testimony in. We're gonna, we're gonna see Gaffy suddenly stop telling people they can't answer. And he's gonna start saying, you can answer and take all the time you want. Just go on and on. Give us as much detail as you want because it'll make the transcripts longer. And those YouTubers, <laughs> those YouTubers will want to pay for those pages. <laughs> and some of this is crazy. But yeah, I'm gonna close this out, guys. This is one year since Jonathan Major's arrest. Um Let's see. So Daisy's saying, hearing Lauren Victoria Burke say that they objected to Detective Mejia's testimony versus reading the transcripts is crazy. Just to see it and read it out makes a difference. No problem, you guys. Honestly, so again, let me reiterate this. You guys, I was so amazed at the crowdsourcing. You guys put together 2,000 of the 2,600 for the initial set, week one of the transcripts, which I thought was just going to be Grace Jabari's, but when it was delivered, it ended up being all of week one. So when that happened, like, I didn't know that anybody would contribute at all. And I'm still overwhelmed and so grateful that you guys did. So I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to get these closing argument transcripts because I want to see them. We did get some press coverage on them, but that's, that's a lot, right? You're not going to cover someone's entire closing argument in one article. So I went and got that and I was like, you know what? Let me get Detective Mejia's too. So that was really interesting to finally take a look at. Um, again, yesterday, Lauren Victoria Burke also guested on 
Danny does this in that live stream with Kirby. I forget his last name, but he's a former prosecutor and criminal defense attorney. He's still a criminal defense attorney, but he practices in Fulton County, but he has experience on both sides of the coin in New York, in New York City. So he's got great insights, um, applicable understanding of things that are specific to New York state law and procedure and code. Really, really, his interviews are, are great. Danny's a great interviewer. She's a lot of fun. Um, Lauren Victoria Berg joins in about an hour in and like spit fires out some, hey, can you tell me about this? Can you tell me about this? And gets a ton of great speed fire question and answers with Kirby. Um, you guys should definitely take a look at that. I'm going to, I think I pulled it up at the beginning of the chat. I don't know if it'll let me. Oh, let me copy. Uh, it won't let me copy and paste from it, but I'm going to go back into the show notes and drop that in there. Or you can just look up Danny does this and that on YouTube. But it was such, such, such a great interview with great insights on how things go in New York from the prosecutorial side. A lot of discussion on why it's interesting that they chose not to prosecute Grace Jabari without a reason. And then I'm like, oh my God, I got to go read these Detective Mejia transcripts because that will shine an even brighter light on exactly what Kirby is pointing out. Um, so go back and watch that. It's a threes a party in there. Um, and then moving forward, when we do have a reply, it we know that Jonathan Majors is not only filing a reply to Grace Jabari's civil suit, but he's going to file a counterclaim, which means we're not just replying to, you know, respond and say, poke holes in your argument that you're making in this this case. And I've got a ton of them to make in response to her reply. Daisy does too. Daisy has a whole list. And I want to figure out a way to kind of break down that um, counters to the civil lawsuit Grace Jabari brought forward. However, I'm a little concerned that, you know, she's Googling her name. She's, she might watch a video like this and start thinking of ways to reverse engineer her counter arguments to our counters, if that makes sense. So while you guys, if you guys want to do some homework and think about her civil suit, how some of the things in her civil suit contradict testimony and things that are on the record in the trial, and even things that are off the record. For example, one of her big complaints is that Jonathan Majors, in his ABC interview, says the line, I've never hit a woman before. I've never laid a hand on a woman before. But you know what she doesn't say was defamatory in that interview? She doesn't say in her complaint that it was defamatory for him to say it's just fake. Because not only in that interview does he bring up his text messages response from September 2022, but he discusses them. He offers additional commentary on them, particularly that I woke up and just it came out of nowhere. None of it was true. It was just fake. She doesn't put that part in her complaint of what's defamatory, what he's saying that's a lie. Why wouldn't she include that part in her complaint? We also see her talk about, hey, in, in court, she says she didn't tell anybody. And that's a core point of the prosecutor's case. Hey, why did she say she got scrappy? Why did she say she doesn't know how her injury ha injuries happened? Because we know Priya Chaudhry was going to say, she said, I don't know, 19 times. Well, they came up with a counter argument to that. And they presented it at trial like, hey, she was afraid to tell anybody. And the only person she told was his manager, Priya, Priya Satyani. She never told anyone else. But we know that's not true. Or it's conflicting with what she's saying in her civil suit. Because in her civil suit, she's saying, hey, I told my friends, I told my family, I told the prosecutor about all, not just March 25th, but I told them about all these prior incidents told them all that. Well, what's the problem with that? Kirby's going to break it down. But in short, Kirby says, hey, look, it's great that Jonathan Majors didn't file a civil suit against her first. In retrospect, I said that that was a possibility a few months ago. Kirby suggested that. And he's like, but thinking about it now, it's interesting because if she's saying stuff in her civil suit that alleges the prosecution knew something, they were told about all these prior things. Well, if the prosecutors knew that stuff, but they didn't disclose it to the defense during trial, that's a big issue. That's a discovery issue for the active criminal case, for, you know, any motions, post-conviction relief and appeal. 
So sounds like a can of worms that Grace Jabari opened, if you ask me. And personally, I did not see that much of a response to her lawsuit besides from people gathering in this chat. Dre did a stream on it. Thank you, Dre, for becoming a member. I just saw you pop up. I think Lauren Victoria Burke did a video on it. Pam's done videos on it. Uh, Danny's stream was all about that. I think Grace Jabari opened a can of worms. And if her goal was to, you know, she wants to avoid humiliation, she wants to avoid people saying bad things about her that could damage her reputation, I don't think that her lawsuit brought people, brought that sympathy spotlight back to her direction. I really don't think so. Because most people have seen that Chase video. And even if people have concerns like, hey, one or two other people came forward and said he kind of has problematic behavior. There's more than one person now. That still has nothing to do with March 25th. And it has nothing to do with Grace Jabari's credibility just because someone else says something. And, you know, those people, we don't have any of their statements under oath, but we could poke, we could ask questions about that stuff separately. But my point is, with Grace Jabari, if she wanted this civil lawsuit, whether she wants to get some money, and let me clarify here, she's not suing for $75,000. She's suing in excess of $75,000. She does not actually disclose the amount she's looking for. But since it's above $75,000, it has to go to a certain a certain pathway through the courts because um, there's other cases that would handle amounts less than $75,000. So we don't know that amount, but she was, she was sure they put that $75K right at the top to make it look like, oh, I'm not really looking for millions or anything like that. That's not what that means. Um, I thought that was very slick. Maybe it was incidental. Maybe it was inadvertent. Um, but that's usually not where, <laughs> where, hey, this is why we're filing in this court. That's usually not where that's laid out in that first sentence. It's usually, you know, jurisdiction and venue. It's its own paragraph after the intro. <laughs> so who knows? Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about this. And maybe we can roundtable people together. But let me know if you guys think... I can do a stream sooner. You know, my birthday's coming up. I would love to do a birthday stream. Just counter arguments, counterpoints to that civil suit case uh, point for point. But at the same time, I think we should wait until we at least have a reply and a countersuit filed by Jonathan Majors, because that way they already have to be... That's when they'll start when deciding how they're going to respond to that stuff. Maybe, uh, maybe we shouldn't be giving them advance notice of things they should be prepared to reverse engineer and argue, right? Um, but let me know if you guys think it matters. Because I'm sure she's going to watch one of our videos on this. <laughs> she's the one that's texting Galloway directly, and she's got to be like, no, you can't text me directly. you got to go to your representatives. Um, <laughs> Barbara says she wants her credit card and red carpets back. <sighs> and then, hey, QT1, you're a little late here today. And then the nerve, unmitigated gall to sue him for malicious prosecution. That guy McFly, that bothered me when I read that. When I started reading that, I was mad reading it until you guys all joined the chat and made me feel like I'm not the only one who feels that way. Yeah, and she should face Bragg for the backfire, not Jonathan Majors. He did all to stay away from her. Yep. So what are you supposed to do if not run away? The DA should be blamed for her public woes. I agree, because they were the ones that needed her to come testify. If she's mad that she had to speak publicly about what happened to her. I don't think she was mad about having to testify against him, at least not mostly mad. I think she was mad that there was that ABC interview, there was public statements by Priya Chaudhry, and she says a concerted media campaign. But surely she's got to mean social media, because where was Rolling Stone, Variety, where were these major outlets talking about anything that wasn't favorable to her? They were arguing against the messengers reporting that she had a desk appearance ticket out. So I don't know what she was, she's talking about a concerted media campaign unless she means social media and she means us. But <laughs> I'm here. I have my opinions and they're based on your own words, Grace Jabari. So let's all, yeah, we're all here because of how we felt. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm, gonna look. I'm glad that I'm not alone in feeling this way about this type of thing. So let's, uh, you know, I'll keep you guys updated on a stream. I'm going to jump out of this stream. I've got a busy week, guys. I started with a new client and still have other clients overlapping with the time. So I've been working like 60-hour days on day job stuff. Um, but I really want to make sure whenever we get a reply and counterclaim, <laughs> we can read through that because we're going to see things. I guarantee you, we are going to see things that we have not seen said by Jonathan Major's side before because we didn't see him testify. 
we have that ABC interview, but it was pretty limited in scope. Um, it'll be it'll be a stream to remember. I'll I'll invite people on. Hope you guys can all be there. It'll be great. Thank you guys all for joining. I'm sorry again that I can't get through all the chats as they're coming in, but you guys are always welcome to chat away while we're covering these things. I don't mind at all. You guys all take care and give me like two seconds to link to Danny's stream in the description and then go check that out with Kirby. Bye guys.